Okay, how to introduce this topic. Um, uh, in my, when Dr. Jeff Volek kind of picked me up and pushed me back into this thing, he said, the thing we have to focus on, you know, this exercise performance stuff is really neat, but if you want to save lives and save money, we've got to do something about type 2 diabetes. So let's regard it not as a disease, but as a food intolerance. What does he mean by that? He's, he's trained as a dietitian, and he said, well, if someone's lactose intolerant and they take fresh milk or this plastic yogurt stuff that isn't even fermented, they just put gelatin to make it look like yogurt, and people are going to be, get, their stomach's going to get upset and they're going to have nausea. And, you know, and the way you make that better is you just take away the lactose and they get better. If someone has gluten intolerance and you take wheat and other gluten-containing foods out of their diet, they get better. So let's think of type 2 diabetes as carbohydrate intolerance. It's a food intolerance. And besides, you don't need lactose to live. Well, if you're an infant and you're breastfeeding, yeah, you need lactose because it's in human breast milk. And most infants, even if they're lactose intolerant later in life, they're, almost all infants are lactose intolerant. But you don't need that lactose once you get past the nursing phase of, of human existence. You don't need to eat gluten to survive. Those Inuit had never had any corn or wheat or barley or oats in their whole lives. They managed to live as, you know, live as, and survive as a culture for 1,800 years in the modern Inuit in the Arctic. And we know that there is no dietary carbohydrate component that is necessary to be eaten in the diet. All the carbohydrate we need in our body, we can make de novo from scrap. Recycle other things like the lactate that the athletes are making. So Jeff said, let's think of it that way. And so we approach that from a research perspective you know, in the bench, and we looked at the, you know, the lab results and so on, and we had to convince ourselves that this could be safe. And then the question is, can we take that to the patient? Can this be done safely? And that's really the odyssey I want to follow with you. And the next thing I want to say about this talk is, I used to be an academic. I gave up academic medicine because my hands were tied and what kind of research I could get funded to do. And I've moved through independent consulting, so now we are part of a venture-funded startup, which is, we've named Verta Health, Corporation, and this is a venture-funded start startup in San Francisco. And what I'm telling you now carries with it a massive conflict of interest because I have ownership stake in that com country. So everything I say to you, you should look at with great skepticism, <laughs> really. But everything I'm going to tell you about what we are doing and what we've done is published in the peer-reviewed medical literature. Doesn't mean it's right, but it means it's passed reasonably skeptical muster by our colleagues. And that's why we have the peer-reviewed process. So what we put in our book, you know, that's, and we, we have these books, and we have our own publishing company because they're self-published books. You know, that's just our opinion, but, and it hasn't passed that kind of muster. So if you buy the book, look at it with even greater skepticism. I just want to say, you know, this is controversial stuff. But our goal was set out to see if we could actually change the paradigm for type 2 diabetes. Because unlike type 1 diabetics that that Dr. Christian is talking about, most people with type 2 diabetes, relatively ex years into their disease, still have the capability of making enough insulin that they can probably get along with a lot less or none of it if we get their, the intolerant component of their diet down low enough. So that's my pitch. I'm done. Thank you. The details. We talk about ketones, but realize that I, as a physician, most dietitians up until recently, in fact, currently recent, up until the current time, most of what we in healthcare professions are taught about ketones is that they're toxic byproducts of fat metabolism. Because if you have type 1 diabetes and don't get enough insulin, your ketones build to the level where they're toxic. And the idea that they actually are a fuel has been known for a long time, but it really isn't taught. And then the novel things now is not only do we know that they're a superior energy supply for certain organs like the brain, but they actually have hormone-like activity and they regulate the body's defenses against basic pathological processes we call oxidative stress and inflammation. Inflammation is you can understand inflammatory diseases like chronic rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory conditions are driven by this process called inflammation and aging is a process tightly linked to oxidative stress. So I'm gonna to try to put those pieces together but I just want to, you know, our analogy is that uh, Ketones have gone from up until recently as kind of the ugly duckling to a soaring eagle, if you will, uh, because now we see, understand that there are things that we've neglected to understand about them that have very significant benefits. 
So the first thing I want to do is differentiate between people who eat, habitually eat a significant amount of carbs, you know, more than 10 or 20 percent of their daily intake is carbs, and most people eating a, quote, balanced diet are more in the 40 to 50 percent carb range. Differentiate between the physiological status of ketones in those individuals where ketone levels are under 0.1 to 0.3 millimolar. So remember, if, if when you folks in, in the rest of the world, except us in the U.S., talk about glucose, you measure it in millimolar, and normal glucose is about 3.5 to, to 5.5. So this is a very low level of ketones if glucose is normally in the 3 to 5 range. But if you go on a fast or eat a well-formulated ketogenic diet, your ketones come up into, guess what, the 3 to 5 range. So there's a tenfold difference, 0 0.3, 1.1 to 0 0.3, up to 3 to 5. However, this bad thing called ketoacidosis that you get into if you're a fairy to produce insulin and you don't take the insulin, ketoacidosis occurs in the 10 to 20 range. So this is a tenfold difference. So this is, this is the difference between being in the total drought in terms of ketones as an energy and signaling supply. This is a normal rainfall that feeds your lawn and your garden and the pastures. This is the storm that, that wipes the pastures and the garden away. It's tenfold difference from here to there and from there to there. It's not a subtle difference. So in this range of over here of ketones, if you had orange juice and, and a croissant for breakfast, your value is going to be down very right down here. If you get above 0.5 and particularly up in the one range, ketones begin to become major fuel for your brain, for muscles and also as signaling molecules having hormone, beneficial hormone-like like activities in the body. Above three, there, we don't have any clear, obvious benefit, although some people studying cancer and animal models think that five to seven is maybe beneficial in terms of trying to push back cancer, but that's not the topic here. But the dangers of ketoacidosis really don't start. I mean, there's warning signs here, but the dangers don't start till you get up above seven and into the 10 to 20 range. When you eat a low carbohydrate diet, even when you do a lot of exercise, which might make you stay in this range here. So you know, again, as I showed you with the, the runners, after they, they finished their three hour run on the treadmill, their ketones went up and that's a known post-exercise phenomenon. But it never takes people up in this danger range. So we're talking about three different parameters. Suppressed ketones, what I call normal ketones, and then the dangerously high values. So, um, as I mentioned, there's, this is just in the last five years that people, again, these, this, this work has not been done by nutrition researchers. This has been done by people who understand how genes in the body are regulated. You know, well, we all have 30,000 functioning genes, we think, functional genes, but most of them are turned off most of the time. How do they get turned on or turned off? Well, there are signaling molecules that regulate them. Um, and it turns out that Oxidative stress and inflammation protections by the body are turned off when you eat enough carbs to make your ketones go down in that very low range. When you bring your ketones up in the one millimolar range, these things get turned on. Is this obscure research? No, this is published in the journal Science in 2013. Uh, and then there's been a landslide of research following that, uh, including the fact that, that beta-hydroxybutyrate um, is not just the signaling oxidative stress and inflammation, but actually it uh, increases insulin sensitivity. And insulin, the opposite, insulin resistance is the harbinger, if you will, of, or, or the underlying physiological um, uh, sign of type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance. So here's a signaling molecule that actually, is almost if it were a drug, it would be, it, and particularly if it could be proven to be a safe drug, would be an extremely profitable thing to put in, the body, in pills and sell. The neat thing is we can help your body make it by just take, taking out enough carbohydrates that you get into that uh, nutritional ketosis range. And then a very technical slide, but the point here is that there is a regulatory gene called the NLRP3 inflammasome. And when this thing is allowed to assemble in this, inside the cell, it turns on a bunch of, it's like a, a master sergeant in the military. It's turning on a whole bunch of inflammatory processes. And it is beta-hydroxybutyrate is an inhibitor of its assembly. So again, we have a lot of information now that a well-formulated ketogenic diet has potent anti-inflammatory effects. We didn't know how. And now we understand the mechanism. And if you want to convince skeptics that something happens, you say, well, it seems to happen in most of my patients. Yeah, right. 
If you have the molecular mechanism, it gives you a much stronger argument to get people's attention that this actually really is a dependable and potentially therapeutic effect. And then for, for this talk, it turns out that it, it, just in, since 2011 and in an increasing tempo of publications indicating that underlying type 2 diabetes and to a great degree preceding the development of type 2 diabetes, inflammation is a predictor and we think a early cause of many of the manifestations of this disease. So if we have some way of reducing inflammation, not only early on, but even late in the disease course, we may be able to understand mechanistically why this seems to put diabetes into a, this, what we call a state of reversal. And again, there's a lot of discussion. Is it, are we curing it? Absolutely not. Is it remission? Well, remission usually implies a long-term effect. So what I'll be talking about uh, in terms of what we're able to do, demonstrate we can do is what we call reversal. So one of the points that comes into any discussion about a ketogenic diet is people say, well, what are the macros? What, how, what percent of carbs, fat, and protein should I be eating? And for people who have weight to lose, and I'll show you data from two different studies on this, and you saw it from the, the ROTC study on the student soldiers at, at Ohio State University, when you, somebody has extra body fat and you put them on a well, get them to eat a well-formulated ketogenic diet, which means they cut their carbohydrate intake down to something in the range of 30 to 50 total, 30 to 50 grams total per day, eat protein in moderation, and then eat fat to satiety. We just say eat enough of these high fat foods or dressings and sauces that you feel you've had enough to eat. They undereat calories compared to what they're burning, and so they lose weight. But as people do this over many months, as the body loses some or much of its excess body fat, our natural instincts say, eat more. And we have something that, for want of a better term, we have to call fat hunger. How do you know if you have fat hunger? If you open the fridge and the butter looks good. <laughs> That's fat hunger. If you do something really extreme, like go out and you know, hike for three straight days, and then come home on, you know, on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and come home on Monday, and you know, your muscles are sore, and you're kind of fatigued, and you eat pretty well, and the next day, on Tuesday, everything with fat in it looks good, that's fat hunger. Um, so people will adjust their fat intake until eventually they'll reach a new steady state. Uh, and they do so by, if, if they increase carbohydrates, only a very small amount, and only as long as that doesn't interfere with their production of an adequate amount of ketones to maintain this be beneficial signaling process. We keep protein constant, and you see this is a minor component of the diet. This is not a high protein diet. But as people come to a new steady state with weight maintenance, where their fat intake is enough to hold them weight stable at a new reduced body weight, you can see the vast majority of their calories are coming from fat. Is this novel? I showed you the Stefanson data where the Inuit and what he did reflecting what he learned from them, he was eating 80% of his calories as fat. This is in the range of 60 or 75. So we have come to understand mechanistically what they understood instinctively and what they built their culture around. It's not new, but it's strange to us who've been taught that eating a high carbohydrate, low fat diet is the healthiest thing to do. So it's, it's pretty controversial in the context of um, most people's concept of what's good nutrition. So what does this look like? You know, people say, well, it's all just bacon and sausage. And the heck, you know, you know, we're not into it. We're not dealing with a, a barren landscape where there are no fruits and vegetables. The question is what and how much. And so when your weight's stable, realize when your body fat isn't contributing to this, and so you have to be eating the fat, protein is moderate, carbohydrates kept low, the majority of calories come from fat, but there are these things, these minerals like potassium and magnesium that we need to maintain healthy muscle and, muscle and heart function. Much of that has to come from vegetables, a small amount of berry fruit. You know, again, you can have some fruit, but you know, 100 grams of berry fruit is gonna provide five to 10 grams of carbs per day. So it can be a component of this, but it can't be a half a kilo of berries. 
uh, because you're going to get way too much sugar and you're, you're going to drive your ketones down to the point where they're no longer uh, providing a beneficial function. So we normally prov provide somewhere between three and five servings of, of non-starchy vegetables in cases where people can tolerate a little bit of berry fruit, nuts and seeds. And you can see there's a wide variety of here, things here, but although the, there's a lot of volume to other things, the fats are going to be the, from coconut, from olive, from avocado, butter, cheese. Those are going to be your primary sources of calories. It's a challenge, but people can actually do this kind of diet as a vegan with no animal products. It's a lot e easier if they're a lacto-ovo vegetarian because we can get a wider range of protein sources and higher biological value proteins. But this is not a necessarily a carnivorous diet, although that makes it easier and for some of us more enjoyable. Uh, uh, variety is, is a spice that we, we tend to enjoy. But there are many ways you can construct this diet. And it doesn't require uh, that one has to eat animal flesh. Uh, and when, it, when animal products are consumed, they're consumed in moderation. So the first study that Jeff and I did, comprehensive study, to look at the safety of this uh, was a study where we uh, recruited 40 people with metabolic syndrome, which is essentially type 2 diabetes, or uh, pre-diabetes. Um, and what we did was we randomized half of them to a calorie-restricted 1,500 calorie per day diet. And that was a low-fat diet where, and again, this is, you say, well, the, you know, the, the protein is, is kind of high here and and such, but this is a 1,500 calories of intake. This is not what they're burning, this is what they're eating. And then the other group was told to eat a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet, and this was not calorie restricted. This diet was, um, we told them to eat to satiety because we knew when people who were overweight, and again, these people had a high BMI, extra body weight, that they would eat 1,500 calories a day in the first few months when they started this. So it was matched in calories by this side being a restricted diet, this side being uh, uh, eaten to satiety. And we had them do this for three months. And the point I'll make here at the bottom is to just point out that in this 24% fat here, whoops, this 24% fat diet, it contained 12 grams of saturated fat. For the group eating 60% of, their of their, what's on their plate as fat, they were eating 36 grams of saturated fat. So three times as much saturated fat is here and here. And the meaning of that will become apparent on the slide after this one. This shows the weight losses of the two groups, realizing they're living as outpatients. They're not in a metabolic research ward. We weren't doing the daily ketone testing like we did with the ROTC recruit study. Uh, we just measured their ketones from a blood sample at the start and again at the end. But notice the weight losses here, that there was double the weight loss for the people following the diet, this ketogenic diet eaten to satiety. Now again, the critics will say, well, you lose a lot of, of water and you lose muscle mass when you're on a ketogenic diet. So, you know, the, the difference here is it really isn't physiologically important. But it turns out that only one kilo of this five kilo difference was from either body water or lean tissue. This was, by body composition analysis, this was much more body fat loss in this group. This shows the individual losses, and notice that the greatest weight loss in the calorie-restricted low-fat diet was equal to the mean average weight loss for this group. So it wasn't just a few people. These few people lost a lot. The, the weight loss was greater, and the body fat loss is greater here. But more importantly, because these people had what we call prediabetes or metabolic syndrome, outlined in green here are, are some of the key components of metabolic syndrome, increased abdominal fat, elevated blood triglycerides, reduced uh, high density um, uh, eight, uh, cholesterol, and impaired glucose tolerance. And you can see that the improvement in body fat in red, improvement in triglycerides, and which going lower here is better, going higher for HDL is better, going lower for glucose is better. Those four components of prediabetes and metabolic syndrome all got much better in the people who are following the ketogenic diet. Remember I told you that the group which was eating the ketogenic diet were eating three times as much saturated fat. Now, pretty much everybody here has heard this old, old um, uh, sound bite that you are what you eat, right? So if you eat three times as much saturated fat, you should have three, much, three times as much saturated fat in your blood. 
this is the change in fat, saturated fat. The people who ate the low fat diet, their saturated fat levels went down. But here's the paradox. The people who ate three times as much saturated fat, their reduction in blood saturated fat levels were more than double as the fat. How could that be? Anybody want to guess? I gave you the answer in the previous talk. Keto adaptation more than doubles the body's use of fat for fuel. Not just during exercise, but at rest. This stuff becomes the body's preferred energy source. And it doesn't build up. It goes down because it's being burned more rapidly. So being keto adapted gives your body permission to dispose of, dispose of saturated fat, which means I can't, you, it doesn't mean you can eat it in, in, with impunity in every mix of foods. You know, if you have a, a croissant made with butter, with butter on top of it, you know, the, the carbohydrate in the croissant is going to block this benefit. But if you're keto adapted, you can get rid of it. It's not going to build up. It's not toxic. And then I mentioned inflammation. People say, well, what do you test for inflammation? Well, there's this whole alphabet soup of inf inflammation biomarkers. And we tested just 14 of them. <laughs> of the 14, seven didn't differ between the two groups. This set of alphabet soup biomarkers didn't differ. But of the other seven, all of the other seven were dramatically improved in favor of the ketogenic diet. That nutritional ketosis has a potent anti-inflammatory benefit. And it's a lot safer than any drug you can take that will reduce inflammation this much. Well, I, will, I would contend that it's a lot safer, in part because we know cultures of people, not just the Inuit, but the Maasai who lived in, in, in the Great Rift Valley in, in Africa. We know they lived for over a 1,000 years as pretty much pure herders and didn't eat, particularly the, the warrior class males, didn't eat any vegetable products. Uh, and it didn't seem to harm them, and, and they, they were able to grow much taller than most other uh, cultures living in Africa. Uh, so again, a potent anti-inflammatory effect, and we've confirmed that in multiple studies. This was just the first one to do that. So moving on to type 2 diabetes, um, I want to point out that there is history here. Again, this is not novel. As Dr. Kushner pointed out to you, before we had insulin, the only treatment for um, people who had whichever type of diabetes, type 1 or type 2, the only treatment was carbohydrate restriction. And we know that, that diabetes, not just it, uh, childhood, but adult uh, diabetes has been treated traditionally with low-carb diets before we had insulin. And my mentor, Dr. Bruce Bistrian at Harvard, um, did this study and published. This is the first modern study that I know of using a ketogenic diet to reverse type 2 diabetes. And I don't have a table because back in the 1970s, you just published the, show the, the data from each study. So this is one patient whose sugar started 300 milligrams per deciliter translates to, what, about 18 millimolar? So very high blood sugars, uh, obese patient in a metabolic ward over 40 days, she started out on insulin, was on insulin for 19 days. They stopped the insulin, and when they, her glucose came down, she stayed in the diet. And her blood sugars pretty much came down to normal, just on diet alone with, after withdrawal of insulin, associated with weight loss. And Dr. Vistrian had seven of these cases, and he published it in 1976. And like my 1980 and 83 papers on diet and physical, no carb diets and physical performance, this is sat there unrefuted, but it you know, was not respected as real science. More recently, a physician uh, scientist a, in Philadelphia, uh, at a university in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, did a study where he and his team took 10 people with type 2 diabetes, put them in a metabolic research ward, and gave them a buffet and said, eat anything you want from this buffet. And it was a, a, a buffet of a, a mixed carbohydrate fat diet. And they could choose what they wanted. And they chose to eat about 3,100 calories a day, which is appropriate for the fact that they were very severely obese. You know, their BMI of about 40 would represent have being at least 100 pounds overweight. And they ate that, that diet for a week and stayed weight stable. And then they changed the buffet. So they, they gave them more, and they said, tomorrow you're going to have a different list of foods, but still eat as much as you want. But they took the carbs off the buffet. And so the average person went from eating a few hundred grams of carbohydrates a day to using, eating 20 grams a day. And they spontaneously reduced their calorie intake from 3,100 to 2,100 calories per day. And they started losing weight. And then they 
measured over at ba during the high carb diet and then the low carb diet, they measured blood sugar values all across a 24 hour time span. And so these are frequent blood sugar values at baseline. And, and again, normal values are under six. And here you can see they range from eight to 10. So this is hyperglycemia with very high insulin levels. And just two weeks later, when they'd lost two kilograms of body weight, so they hadn't normalized their, their body weight at all. And they measured their daily their blood sugars across the day. There was a slight spike in the morning called the dawn phenomenon. And then their blood sugar stayed pretty much normal. And most of their medicines had been withdrawn. In just two weeks, they had basically made these people from poorly controlled type 2 diabetes to virtually being non-diabetic. And the fascinating thing is, the amount of insulin in their blood was much lower and they had much better glucose control. And the only answer to that explanation that is they dramatically improved their um, uh, insulin resistance. So it's basically in two weeks that it virtually re reversed this, you know, quote, chronic disease. Uh, the problem with this is that when you have people on diabetes medications, so it says here that medica medications were reduced. In two weeks, they had to take them off of insulin and other medications. You can't do that by putting a person on a diet and say, come back and see me in two months, which is what most of us as physicians working in an office practice will say. I mean, you, you, you can't see that person every other day or every day and say, change your medicine. It just that doesn't work. So you can do this in a hospital where they're locked up in a research ward, but that's frightfully expensive. You know, the real cost is thousands of dollars per day to manage patients in what's basically an intensive care setting to take them off their medications up until now. So this is where this thing called Verta comes in. And I didn't come up with this. I, I came up with the diet idea along with Jeff Volek, but the, the idea of how do you make this safe in an outpatient setting came from some Silicon Valley people who know how to build websites and, and communicate directly with people on a real-time basis, you know. And it used to be, remember when the phone was on the wall with a cord on it? And you might use it three times a day, and now you look at it every five minutes? So you take that device, that's the technology. Take that device, and you turn it into a communications device for interacting with patients. So we put our patient in the center of our diagram here, so we're patient-centered. They have an a, 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 a app on the phone. They have a glucometer to test glucose. They, have, they use the same device to test ketones. They're in real-time touch with a coach who's specially trained by us. We have our own physicians in our clinical practice who are in touch with the coach and the patient. And so we have this tight communication loop. And when we take them off most of their carbs and we tell them how to do it, and we have to adjust their medications and reinforce the fact this is safe, you know, just keep doing it. It ends up they, when we track it, their community, the patient is communicating with, their, with our team 3.1 times per day. There is no way an office-based physician can do this. And in a sense, we're doing outpatient intensive care. And this is absolutely necessary for safe medication withdrawal. This is not something you would do casually and say, come back and see me in a few weeks or a few months. Uh, this is a... Um, it's a bold new way to practice medicine. And the question is, can it be safe? Oh, by the way, and yes, they, we have a community, patient community, uh, that, where they interact with each other and support each other. They get to look at little, you know, little talking heads like me that tell them all about all this boring details of, you know, make sure you eat your vegetables and don't eat too much fruit and that kind of stuff. So by the way, we have permission to show all these pictures because all these people have given us on-camera testimonials that. The, the fact that this worked for them. Testimonials don't prove anything. Statistics are important. It's not just how many successes you had, but how many people did you try to get that many successes. If 10% of the people do well and 90% of the people don't do well, you can still have lots of testimonials. So we started with 262 people in a small town in um, uh, the state of Indiana. And these are 262 people with type 2 diabetes. They averaged age 54. They were very overweight. Uh, Two-thirds of them were female. And we did not, this is not a randomized trial. We, because you can't blind people to which diet they're on. They know which diet they're on. 
Uh, so we had a parallel control group. I'm not going to bore you with their data, but they got usual care. But these, this is just the, the people with type 2 diabetes that we uh, put in this project. We've published two peer-reviewed papers. So all the data I'm going to show you has been published this year. Uh, and Dr. Sarah Hallberg, uh, who is a remarkable physician in Indiana, who came to us and said, we, you got to, I've been trying this, this diet you, you've written about in your books. And it's really very effective. But I'm concerned that some of the things that are happening are pretty dangerous. And we've got to check this out. So uh, she came to us and said, let's do this. Um, and it's been a, just a remarkable experience working with her. So the first thing is, can people stay with this kind of program? If you give them this thing in their pocket, do they get bored with it and say, oh, I don't want to do this anymore? Our retention rate was 83% at one year uh, for the people who enrolled with, with type 2 diabetes enrolled in our intervention. Can they stay in nutritional ketosis? Well, the more insulin resistant you are, and insulin resistance is the underlying factor um, that, that defines type 2 diabetes, they are very insulin resistant. They're very hard to get into ketosis. And yet you can see here that this is the ketone value initially over the, this is in the first few months. And remember, 0.5 is our threshold, our arbitrary threshold. And they stayed in it on average in nutrition ketosis out to eight months. And they still had much higher values than if they were eating a lot of carbs, which would be down here at a year. So not just continuing to work with us through our virtual program. Because again, they're getting, this is telemedicine. But they stayed with us uh, and were able to significantly restrict carbs for the duration as a group. What happened to medications? Remember, I said, in the other studies when this had been done, we had to take away people's meds. And these are the medications that we took away. So the, the dark bars here are meds that were stopped. The blue-gray bars are reductions. Light-colored bars here are no change. This is um, uh, increase. And then new medications here. But the most dangerous medications for hypoglycemia are sulfonylureas and insulin. And you can see that we completely stopped the sulfonylureas. We cut about half the people. The people stopped their insulin in half the cases, and almost half the cases they reduced it. So, and then there's uh, this group called SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, a significant number. Of the, this, there were very few in this class of medications. But you can see that more than half the medicines were discontinued. And in many cases, the, the other medicines were reduced. The ones that we didn't change, particularly metformin, which is uh, not just, it, it has a modest effect in lowering blood glucose, but it is now considered a, a medication that prevents di the people from developing type 2 diabetes. So if we had people who had diabetes, we're not going to take them off this medicine, which is going to help keep them in a reverse state. So we don't take that away. But the rest of them, for most of them, we had a dramatic effect on medication use. And by the way, that translates into a dramatic reduction in the cost of care. What happened to the diabetes control? If we use the most rigid standard for percent who got off of all medicines and had a blood sugar under, or hemoglobin A1C, under the diabetes range, it was 47%. Uh, and that was for all, all comers who entered our program. If you calculate from the, of the 83% who stayed in the program at one year, the reversal rate was 60%. The standard of care, the result typically is about 1% in any one year will achieve that result. Because this is considered a chronic progressive disease that can't be stopped. And this is in our first attempt with, I would say, our, our initial app that they're getting is a fairly crude tool. We can refine that a lot. But I won't make any wild claims of what we'll do in the future. This is a remarkable result. And on average, their hemoglobin A1C dropped from 7.5 to 6.4 here to 6.2 here. At, at one year. What happened to their weight? Now remember, we tell these people from the get-go to eat to satiety. They want to lose weight. But we tell them, eat to satiety. And this is what happens when that out to eight months, they're, they're losing weight. And for the last four months of the year, they're weight stable. Which, again, this is not our goal. Our goal is metabolic health. But for people who have striven in the past to lose weight and not succeeded, you know, their answer, their, the, the, the common answer to us is, I don't know how that happened, but you know, it's, it, it was much easier than I expected. Did they all get down to normal body weight? No, most of them didn't. We're not going to make people into you know, what, they were, what they looked like at age 16. We're trying to achieve metabolic health. And this is a side benefit 
but it's oftentimes a very motivating benefit. One of the things that concerned Dr. Hallberg when she came to us and said, we've got to study this, is many of the patients, when they go on the well-formulated ketogenic diet, they see a significant reduction in what we call the LDL cholesterol, which is the so-called bad cholesterol. But more than half the patients actually see a rise in LDL. And some of them have a dramatic rise in LDL, and that's really scary. On average, it's about a 10% increase across the whole population. But you may be aware that there's a raging controversy now as to whether LDL cholesterol actually is a useful predictor of heart attack risk. Uh, because there are lots of other predictors that have come along. And here's a list of, I think, how many is this, 18, no, 16, biomarkers of cardiovascular risk, including triglycerides, HDL cholesterol, the ratio of the two, et cetera, et cetera. And for anywhere where you see a star here, the blue star indicates a highly statistically significant benefit in favor of the low carb or ketogenic diet. The two NSs here means there wasn't a difference between the two diets. Other than the LDL cholesterol, everything else was either neutral or came out, the vast majority came out in favor of the safety of a ketogenic diet. And in particular, um, the, this thing called LDL size, it turns out that LDL is not one uniform com component in blood. It comes in small and large components. The small are the most dangerous, and the large actually probably are protective. And we saw a significant increase in LDL size in the great majority of the patients, which really pulls the, and then the small part, small group, went much lower. So again, blue means, uh, and blue star means benefit on the side. So all these factors taken together imply that, that the cardiovascular risk from inflammation, from uh, uh, LDL and, and uh, particle, LDL particle size and triglycerides and HDL really come out in, in favor of, it, of this being a beneficial change. Have we done the long-term five to 10 year study that says that we, if we do this in 10,000 patients, and have 10,000 patients who aren't doing it, we reduce the mortality in that? No, we have not done that study. That study would cost 50 million, 100 million? What do you think? 100? Think yeah. <laughs> we just need to find the money. Uh, but as biomarkers go, this is a pretty strong argument. So here are data from three studies published this, just this year. The blue line here is our study, and this is our data out to one year. This here, the green line, was done in northern UK and Scotland called the Direct Study, published in The Lancet earlier this year. And they used a packaged formula, no food, just packaged formula for three to five months. People lost a whole lot of weight initially, but as soon as they added back real food and they said, you know, eat a, eat a healthy diet. They didn't say eat a ketogenic diet. You can see from the time they transitioned to the to the uh, real food guitar contained, it started gaining weight. This red line here is closer to home. This is a study done by uh, a group here in Australia, in Adelaide, uh, uh, and uh, uh, with Dr. Manny Noakes and, and Grant Brinkworth. And they did a study with a, initially a ketogenic diet, but then again, added back carbs. Said, you know, we don't think anybody can follow this long term and see what happened. And the effect on Hemoglobin A1C, this is our values here. You can see that the UK study went down sharply, uh, but was higher than ours. And the study here in Australia actually had, had good results. Went from 7.3, ours started at 7.6, came down about where we did, but again, they're on their way back up. Am I gonna show you our two-year data? No, because we haven't published it. Uh, but we've completed the data and we're, we're about to submit it for publication. Uh, and I'll just say that we're, we're pleased with the results we've seen, and maybe if I come back in a year, I can share that with you. So the pros of this is that ketones, unlike what we've been taught for a great deal of the, of the past decades, is actually has physiological benefits and, and positive signaling effects. The, the, the dangers of this is that if you try to do a well-formulated ketogenic diet and people on medications for diabetes, you're likely to do harm if you don't you aren't able to change that medication in response to the prompt changes very quickly. Um, 
And I would, I, as a conservative interest, would say, we need to have two and show you two year to five year data before we would say this is going to become the standard of care. But it, clearly, we have a potentially very powerful tool not to treat type 2 diabetes as a chronic progressive disease, but as a reversible disease. Um, and the other important thing is outpatient nutritional ketosis is really difficult to sustain because everyone around us tells us, hey, that's dangerous. Uh, and even our physicians will sometimes tell us, oh, you shouldn't do that. It's dangerous. If we can provide an adequate real-time support system, so this is like the technology that Dr. Christian is talking about, you have you know, the, the, the pump delivery systems and, and insulin delivery, and you get, but if you take the people off the roller coaster and you give them that long, sustained thing, you get a different outcome. And if we provide this kind of patient communication tool where the patient is in the center of the communication, not at the far end of the communication process, it can have very, potentially very significant effects on reversing this disease. And this is the group that, um, on this side of the people actually did, in the clinical team who did the work, centered on Dr. Sarah Hallberg here, and then this is the group that uh, wrote up the results and tried to get it published, which was a, a challenge in and of itself. So thank you, and if we have time, I'll take questions.